Opening the eyes of the universe. The following is a presentation of Truth and Love Advent Ministries. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so very much for your loving kindness and your tender mercies towards us. Thank you for doing for us and to us that which only you can. Lord God, as we get ready to dig deep, dig a little deeper into that word of truth, Lord, even as we were reminded this morning constantly staying beside the waters that make our leaves green, Father, we come again to be refreshed and as your word says to constantly be reminded, though we need it, we already know these things and needing to be established in the present truth. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory that you so richly deserve. I pray a blessing upon each and every one of us on tonight, Lord, children of the King. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful privilege that is, Lord God. Father, just as we get ready to pray, I just as we continue to pray, Lord God, I just want to ask you to be with the person that we've set aside today to pray for, Brother Obin. Just thank you, Lord God, for your manifold blessings towards us as a people, dear Lord God, and our brother as we just set him aside, dear Lord God. Thank you for this even his desire, his heart, dear God, to know you more, Lord God, to want others to know you more, and your desire, Lord God, to bring him, to draw him, to save him to your kingdom. Be with all that concerns him, dear God, his family, his everything about him, dear Lord God, that you just be with him and that you will save him at last into your kingdom as one of the men of truth, dear Lord God. I pray that he'll continue to uphold the standard of truth and righteousness for your name's sake. And Lord God, as we all gather here on this evening, I pray that you will bless us abundantly, open up our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to receive these counsels of truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to open up our Bibles to our scripture readings. First is Isaiah 58 and verse 12. Isaiah 58 and verse 12. That's our first scripture reading. Like I said, we're going to be looking at the book, Early Writings. The chapter is entitled The Shake, and we're going to get there in a, a little bit. But first, we're going to just cover a few points as we get there. Isaiah 58 and verse 12. The Bible says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. This is a prophecy of this end time generation of God's people. And as we finish the Reformation and finish on a glorious note, brethren, let us constantly keep in mind that we are doing a glorious work, a work that, as the Bible says, that they who have gone on before us will not be raised up without this work, meeting its completion, meeting its, its ultimate conclusion. They that shall be of thee shall build up the old waste places. And we're going to talk about those old waste places in a second. But for right now, I want us to focus on something very important. And I began to make mention of it some 500 years ago, a young monk seeing all of the evils and the horrors of his beloved church. Not stealthily, because obviously it, it being a holiday, you know, one of the sacred days of the Catholic Church, he went boldly to his local church door and nailed his 95 points of reasoning that he had against the sales of indulgence and all these things that were happening in his church. I'm saying to us today, if in 2023, as it was back then, do we see things happening that we could build up 95 points? That's another thing too, as I was um, contemplating today, is if we can give an, a clear and a, a crisp articulation of what we believe in 2023. Persons ask us the reasons for our faith. We will be able to not just write them down, but enunciate them towards those who are listening. As I shared this morning in devotion, it, um, you, you, you hear my voice, right? And it's probably sounding normal, probably as Elder said, loud and clear. But Elder, what you don't know, as I shared with the brethren this morning, I was shaken 
on side with something I heard and it just shook me to my core. And I think I posted a little bit of it on the WhatsApp chat, but as of this moment, I'm doing better. But this pastor that I made mention of over this past year, as I said, I knew he was getting to a place. I knew he was getting to an ultimate conclusion with his that Jesus is not, you know, God and all the posts that he's been posting and his ultimate posts. And it goes a little paraphrasing. If you're worshiping Jesus, you're committing idolatry. If you're worshiping Jesus as God, make it even clearer, you're committing idolatry. He is not the creator and therefore he does not deserve worship that came from the pen you know virtually of i would say you know he's calls himself an sdf pastor i'll go with that you know somebody who studies and all of that and juxtapose that with what we're looking at just now the fact that the whole issue of where we are at today in 2023 began with the notion of who is god and does he deserve worship Watch this. Hosea 6, 1 to 3 says, Come and let us return unto the Lord. See, so Isaiah 58, 12, what was that? Saying to us as a people, You are. You are the people of the restoration. You are the people of the end times where God's truth is going to be elevated. And Hosea 6, 1 begins with the word, Come and let us return unto the Lord. See, that's the fallen position from where we fell. Right? Verse 2 says, After two days, Will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight, finishing the reformation and finishing strong. Verse 3. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. Again, our title of our class this evening is Finishing the Ref Reformation, Elevating the Standard of Truth. And the whole thing resonates with that thought God and the standards of who he is and putting him back in his rightful position. Point number one, before we get into our reading, for those who just joined, we're going to be reading from the book, Early Writings, the chapter, The Shaken, in a little bit, but we're going to get there after a couple of points. Just want to raise them. And so, as I said, we're coming full circle in the theme of the restoration of the view of God. And we talked about in Isaiah 58, 12, just now, the trampled truth restored and Hosea 6 talked about it being elevated. So I just made mention of the assault on God and his character. And as all of us know, it began in heaven. And Satan, the wily foe, I mean, his modus operandi never, ever changes. Never, ever changes. And that's why we get tripped up and trapped up because he doesn't have any new tactics. He uses the same old ones that work. If it's not broken, it does, don't fix it. Look at him. He, he says, okay, going around with angels. You know, we are spiritual beings. We are, we are elevated. We are uh, people of a higher standard. Why do we need rules? Why do we need laws? And now he, he's introducing someone who used to mop the floors in heaven as equal with himself. You guys saw him walking around here. I mean, I'm, I'm brighter. I'm shinier. And he's saying that this person is one with him now. See, this is what I'm talking about when it says his laws are unfair. We don't need this. I think there needs to be a better way. And we, we should be independent. And he peddles that lie and he puts it in the ears of a few angels. The next thing you know, there's dissension in the ranks. Comes to earth and again whispers into not Adam and Eve, but into the ears of a serpent and uses that as a medium. Let me in and your standard is going to be more glorious. You can fly now in your beautiful, but I'm going to make you better. I just need to use you for a job. What? Trust me. And he tells Eve in her falling away position from her husband, did God really say, again, impugning the character of God. Watch him now. Watch him now. Generations later, in a time beyond, that son that he hates so much. And beloved, that is what I saw as I was actually sitting here, just like, going back and replaying what I've been experiencing with this whole one true God movement. This is where it's been headed. Hatred for Jesus Christ and behind that, that one who originally began that hate movement. And here he is now in the wilderness of temptation 
after 40 days of fasting and the Son of God as the Son of Man emaciated, if thou be the Son of God, he says, if thou be. This is Bible class, and so my audience, I have a question for you. If someone would like to unmute and answer the question, and the question is, why did Satan say, if thou be the Son of God? Let me hear from you as we continue. Question, easy question. No, no, no trips, traps, or anything trying to, you know, sound any better than what you probably think it might be. Easy question. Why did Satan say, if you be the Son of God? Anybody on you answer the question. Try to get him to doubt his identity in the Father. Yes, but what specifically made him use those words, if you be the Son of God? What made him use those words? That's what I'm asking. Why did Satan use those words specifically? If you be the Son of God, there's a specific reason I'm looking for. Very easy answer. And again, it goes back to the beginning. Anybody? Anyone else wants to venture a guess? All right. Again, like I said, simple answer. God had already declared him to be. Remember six weeks before? Jordan, baptism. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So in the beginning, well, in the eternity past, as we use the language, he was declared to be the Son of God. Here at the baptism, he was declared to be the Son of God, but he was functioning as the Son of Man. And the voice of confirmation says, this is my beloved Son, right, in whom I'm well pleased. And so six weeks later, weak and emaciated, fasting, and alone in that desert, the wilderness, Satan comes to Christ and seeks and seeks to do what he did with the angels, and seeks to do what he did with Adam and Eve. The difference is, while the other angels, while Adam and Eve had lost connection, this connection was constantly maintained. And that's another theme of what we're gonna be looking at tonight. That's a very important theme of what we're gonna be looking at tonight, that constant connection. Another thought, another point. We're told that in these last days, and even from way back, that the greatest, our greatest opposition, our greatest foes will not be, say, as it talks about in Matthew, going to be before magistrates and kings and all those people, and you're going to be this, that, and the other. The greatest foes are going to be from within the household. And so, again, remember our Bible studies topic, elevating the standard of truth. When we seek to step away from the pack and say, like Luther, you know what? I know I'm a monk. I know I'm being elevated into high honor. I know that my church trusts me with this, that, and the other, but I am not satisfied with conditions of things. It's not the president of the United States or Congress or the mayors or the governors who are going to take notice and start to persecute you. It is those who are not highly valuing the standard who are going to raise up and say, wait a minute, who does this fellow think he is? Who does this girl think she is? They smell themselves. Wait a minute now. Rain yourself in. You know what, brethren? You know what? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Persons have experienced that in the past. I was just talking to a friend of mine this past Sunday about such a brother. We didn't go into all the details, but you get assaulted left, right, and center, and you're not connected. You're connected to a group. You're connected to your church, and that's your foundation, but not connected to Christ. And so you're going to submit to pressure. And again, from our scripture reading, for those of you who came on a little bit later, we're looking at Isaiah 58, 12, Hosea 6, 1 to 3. The Bible says, They that shall be of thee, they shall raise up the foundations of many generations. But in order for that to take place, beloved, we must be raised up. Our standards must be made high. We must be constantly beholding him. Remember, in the fallen away, right? This is the last one. Okay, so we talked about heaven. We talked about Eden. We talked about the wilderness. In our time, what happened? What did the Bible say? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to say verse 9. Verse, oh, early on. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul speaking to Tim Timothy to Titus, I think, or Timothy. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a fallen away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So we're talking about here in the original causes of the fall that led to there needing to be a reformation that, of course, you know, began early on with the Waldensians, and of course, those who were seen what was taking place in their day. 
Verse 4 says, Who opposed and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped as God, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And again, we know that the temple of God is in the mind of the believer. And we know that if Satan, even now, again, remember we, uh, the medium, okay, and you talk about it, but in the wilderness, we know that he appeared as a glorious angel, Satan in disguise, angel of light, manifests himself as an angel of light. And here he manifests himself through the head of the church. Again, appearing in white, appearing to be all good and everything, but the modus operandi is still the same, to do away with worship of God, elevation of God. And of course, it is so easy. And this is something I learned early on in my Christian experience that made me go, hmm, to ease himself into the position of the Son of God. That's, that's where he wants to be, to, to take Christ out of the equation and ease himself in there. And that's what we've seen through the papacy, the agent of Christ on earth, the agent of God on earth, Christ. I, says, Christ said in Matthew that there'll be persons coming and saying, I am Christ. And we know that not so much verbally, but through the manifestations. And that's what we've seen. And what happened in that crisis was that, again, God in Christ was taken off his position Again, our intercessor, and that position was invested in a man. And we know that all the flood of errors and lies that has taken place over the past 1,000 plus years have been because man has put himself in the position of God. And we're living with the results. But again, in finishing the Reformation, we must finish strong. Beloved, all the garbage, all the rubbish that was swept up in place of the truth, we must sweep it away and reveal the gem of truth. The standard of righteousness, the standard of truth that has been allowed to trail in the dust, we must elevate it. But beloved, again, as I said, we can't elevate anything unless we elevate ourselves. Because more than anything else, persons don't want to know that scripture in Isaiah 58, of course, you know, it ends with the restoration of the Sabbath truth. But if we have no rest day or night, how can we talk to people and tell them that, you know, this is a message of rest? If we say that, you know, God is such a way and then act contrary, how are we declaring him to be such? All we're doing is siding with the great deceiver and that is one of the things that we really need to guard against because the line of truth and the line of error, right? Again, Jesus calls it the narrow road experience and there'll be very few that find it. That, that's how important it is for us to know where we are and to stand on that path of righteousness, to stay, as we talked about this morning in the devotion, stay beside that water that keeps us evergreen. If our roots don't go down deep and our branches reach up high, we're in trouble because it means that we are not, we are not staying close to the source of truth. At this time, we're going to transition over into our reading for this evening from the book, Early Writings, and we're going to be looking at the chapter, The Shaken. And as we go through the reading, beloved, I just want us to keep in mind, keep in mind that as you see on my screen, we're finishing the Reformation, and by God's grace, we're finishing strong. We're saying to the Lord, we're saying to the unlooking universe, we're saying to everyone that's watching and beholding, and we're saying to those who have gone on before us, those who've paved the way for us, that we're going to finish this in this our generation. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries, pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. That's how high the standards got to be, brethren. Firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenance, so it could be seen upon their face. It wasn't just upon their lips that we mean business. It was seen even in their countenance. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then, their faces would light up, with the marks of God's approbation, and again the same solemn, earnest, anxious look will settle upon them. Again, this is the work of God's people in these end times. 
evil angels crowded around, pressing darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view, that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounded them, and thus they be led to distrust God and murmur against him. Again, remember the old lie. We are special. We don't need laws. Look at us. Why is he telling us, you know, these, these things? We, we could govern ourselves. We know better than that. Eve, Adam, did God really say? Are you sure you heard him? Do you trust them? Don't you think you're, you, you're way beyond that? He's holding back from you. You ought to know better. And I'm here to tell you better because I'm the one who loves you. Oh, my friends, if you thought that the angels got a good, you know, dose of it in their ears and Adam and Eve and even our Savior in Eden and the beloved brethren at the start of the church movement, people of the end times are going to get it much worse. Because again, remember Hebrews 11, without us, all of them that have gone on before did not rise up. And of course, this, as I said, has to be the movement of people that says, that's it, we're done. The race is over in this generation. We have to mean business. And that's why this scene that we read here in early writings has got to be our experience. We've got to make prayer a priority. We have got to make Bible study. And I don't mean Bible reading, you know, reading John 3, 16, beautiful passage. We've got to understand even those two words of John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept and make a whole sermon out of those two words and make it our experience. Here these people understand how important it is that it is a battle. And for many of us, it is no longer a battle. The, 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 the thought of Jesus coming soon no longer thrills people's hearts because as Jesus said, the cares of this life and the deceitfulness, not just of riches, but even just trying to get by and try to be able to pay the rent is going to crowd out the work of the gospel. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. So darkness surrounded them, and thus they be led to distress and murmur against him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes directed upward. Angels of God had charged over his people, and as the poisonous atmosphere of evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the heavenly angels were continually wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness. You see, beloved, this is the atmosphere we need to be. You know, trust me when I tell you, I wonder how, starting with even the world dances, you know, and this reading great controversy and the, the men and women, boys and girls from back then, what kind of courage they must have had to come up against this, not just a religious power, but a political, a military power who didn't even have their own standing army, but could command the standing the army, the regular army of any country. You see these people over here? Go and get them, destroy them, obliterate them. And yet they stood firm. They didn't capitulate. And that's why we have the movement we have today. Because persons stood their ground and they stood up for Jesus. Like I said, oh, no wonder. But as the songwriter said, their faith looked up to God and that man, and they trusted him with their souls. And the angels of God must have been joyous and joyful in being around such people who held fast the profession of their faith. What about us today, my beloved? What about us today in this final generation? Again, we're not talking about people who took their religion for granted, who said, you know what, God's got this, and then they went off to the beach to have a picnic. They knew that they were in a crisis, and every person was at their post of duty, whether they were the preachers, whether they were the prayer people, whether they were the ones who made the clothes for the homeless. Everybody was doing their duty. But again, just as in Second Chronicles 2020, the singers were at the forefront in this our day, beloved. The prayer people must be at the forefront. As the praying ones continue their earnest cries, at times a ray of light from Jesus came to them to encourage their hearts and light up their countenance. Sad part of the reading coming up now. But this part, let us focus, let us think about that. You see, beloved, as the reading ended in Hosea 6, it talked about the outpouring of the latter rain. And that's the refreshing from the presence of the Lord that emboldened the disciples. I shared with the brethren this morning in devotion how much that is my prayer going forward because 
if that brother pastor could, you know, I, I looked at it and it was like, in my mentality, he was like fishing, you know, casting out his bait. Okay, is this fly going to work? Is this going to, worm going to work? Is what, what was, and then he saw that he had an audience. And so, you know what, he just went in for the kill. This is what I really believe about this Jesus. He's not to be worshipped. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we think that God is going to arbitrarily save us at some time of his convenience and we are not prizing those things, or we're going to be sadly mistaken. But God, I... Hmm, you know the story. We prophesied in the streets. We did this, we did that. We did many wonderful works, they said. They didn't tell him, oh, Lord, we're sorry that we sinned and we, you know, we did act of the fool. They told him that they did all their churchly duties. They prophesied and preached and they cast out demons and they did all the wonderful stuff. And yet what did Jesus say? I know you're not. Depart from me. Same thing in this our generation. That, that's the excuse that we're going to give. Oh, you know, I, I paid my tithes last week, Lord. Lord, didn't you see me going out on Sunday? Everybody else was tucked in their beds, but I was out. I was out. I mean, don't you think I, I deserve a beach day? Come on. Some, this is where I was headed, some I saw did not participate in this work. It's not talking about the work of sitting in the pew on Sabbath. It's talking about going out there in the fields and ministering to the lost, as important as those things are. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and they shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest, praying ones. I saw angels of God hastening to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. I was trying to, I was in a, a back and forth with someone and it was a she, she was trying to convince me that it was our obedience that's going to save us. And I was trying to tell her, no, it's the love of God that's going to save us. And if we're not experiencing and embracing this love of God, the obedience, which is just the fruit, not the root, is not going to do us anything. I quoted her, the rich young ruler. And he said, when Jesus said, you know, about the commandments, he said, oh, yeah, all of these I've done from my youth up. All of these, what lack I yet? So he was saying that, you know, he was a good, faithful letter keeper. And Jesus did not, notice, Jesus did not say, uh-uh, I got you. I was watching you all along. I know you didn't do this and you didn't do that. Jesus didn't call him on any of that. But you see, the interesting thing was that Jesus was only quoting from one side of the tablet. But here's where the rubber meets the road. Jesus said to him, sell all you have and give to the poor. And that's where the problem was. You see, in the letter form, it, you, you could look good, you know, honoring your mother and father, not still not killing, not cheating. But when the call comes to put God first, have no other gods before me. And that's not something necessarily that you could show in a visible form. We have problems because the standard is not going to be elevated if our God is our obedience, if God is our doing. And that's what that young lady that I was in conversation with was trying to make it out to be. At the end of the day, and her post was something about, you know, I've, I've done this and I've done that, and yet God is still unhappy with me. Well, my friends, we're going to be in a sad shape if we don't truly understand that finishing the Reformation, that putting all these things to bed, is not going to be because of us and what we're doing. And those who went before us, they understood that. That's why, as the apostle said, I count not my life dear unto me. It's not about me. It's not about what I have to bring to the table. It's about God, that Christ in me, the hope of glory. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. I was thinking all throughout today, and it's from this past, it was, I think it was last Friday, when the pastor posted his comments, that it's going to be a sad day 
when after people have said your beautiful words and sung your beautiful songs, your speaker included, that after preaching to others, we'll be castaways and there'll be no sight of us because we neglected the thing that really matter. Beloved, at the end of the day, we need, beloved, we need to find our identity, our assurance and our position, not in ourselves, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, here's the thing. That's exactly what he did for us. And I remember as, I, as reality hit me, and this is where things were headed, I cried. I cried because the Lord Jesus, he did exactly what I just said that we need to do. He lost his divine identity. In fact, I don't even have to guess and ask I know from the scriptures itself that he will never again function as divinity, but always be identified with us. But our problem is that at heart, in heart of hearts, we don't want to be identified with him. We want to have his name, right? But we don't want to follow his ways. We want to be identified as good and regular standing Christians. But when he says, sell all and give to the poor, we're like, but Lord, the light bill, I've got to pay, I've got children, I've got mouths to feed. What are you talking about? And we're not identifying with higher principles. We're going to be lost sight of. I asked the meaning of the shaken at scene and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this te straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. Beloved, finishing the Reformation entails that we elevate that which was trampled to the ground. And as long as we remember, as long as we remember that See, um, basically, it's like this, and it, it's, it's so easy to do. It's so easy to do. It's, it's insidious, right? Um, like, for instance, let's talk about Martin Luther. I mean, I, I could go back and talk about John Wycliffe, and I could insert any of the, you know, reformers, you know, of the past centuries into the position, but let's talk about Martin Luther, right? Like I said, he was a rising superstar of his church. Monk, priest, you know, doctor, highly esteemed among his colleagues and supervisors and superiors, highly esteemed. But like Moses, like Paul, like our Savior, he didn't esteem any of that more than to see his brethren understood what he understood that day in his convent cell when the Lord clearly revealed to him the just shall live by faith. And he wanted all his hearers to know that he knew he lived in a time of extreme superstition and persons depended upon the church, the structure for their righteousness. He knew that the priests and the bishops and the popes themselves have placed themselves in a position where God ought to be. And you know, beloved, you know, I mean, history, history would not have recorded anything about this man as much as it did for our records if he would have just kept his mouth shut kept his head down and continued to follow orders. And believe you me, believe you me, he wasn't blind. He was not blind at all. He had eyes to see what happens to people who go against the church. And yet he was compelled by a higher standard. How about us? I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed. If not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. You see, all of this is hand in hand with one notion, beloved, and that is something that must be made clear, that God himself is on trial. And he says, you are my witnesses, right? And the witnesses are not just going to say, oh yeah, we saw God doing good and he did this and he did that. We must bear out the goodness of God in our lives. Those who have put God in trial must see through his witnesses that, you know what? Maybe we were mistaken all along. 
Because look here, we beat this guy, we stripped this woman of her wealth, we killed the children. And yet, like Job, they continue to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You are my witnesses, elevating the standard of truth. Said the angel, listen, soon I heard a voice like many waters, like many musical instruments, excuse me, all sounded in perfect strains, sweet and harmonious. It surpassed any music I had ever heard, seeming to be full of mercy, compassion, and elevating holy joy. It thrilled through my whole being, said the angel. Look, my attention was then turned to the company I had seen who were mightily shaken. I was shown those whom I had before seen weeping and praying in agony of spirit. The company of the guardian angels around them had been doubled, and they were clothed with an armor from their head to their feet. They moved in exact order, like a company of soldiers. Their countenances expressed the severe conflict which they had endured, the agonizing struggle they had passed through. Yet, powerful word, yet, their features marked with severe internal anguish, now shone with the light and glory of heaven. They had obtained the victory, and it called forth from them the deepest gratitude and holy, sacred joy. That's how Sister Carol ended devotion, and that's what she brought us back to, the mindset that as God's people, no matter what, we have got to exhibit this attitude of gratitude. This sacred joy must continue to be our position. And that is why the admonition to find our roots grounded deep and be constantly surrounded by the living waters. In closing, the company of this company, the numbers, excuse me, of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it did not obtain it, and they were left behind in darkness, and their places were immediately, I love that thought, immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks, praise God. Again, beloved, this is why I said earlier, we dare not take what we have now for granted because somebody is just hungry enough to come in and the moment they see an opportunity to grab hold. Beloved, Jesus himself was clear on it. Do not let anyone take your crown. Yes, crowns for everyone. There's crowns for everyone. But some of us are going to be like, you know what? It's not worth it. Persecution is not worth it. The suffering is not worth it. The name calling is not worth it. I did not sign up for this. Unlike Jesus, unlike Jesus, we would say, I didn't know what was going to happen. I couldn't see the future. I didn't, I didn't know. I, I'm out. I'm, I can't take this. And join the ranks of the opposition. But as we just read, there are persons who are all too excited to come in and take up the ranks of righteousness and to elevate the standard of truth very high. Evil angels still pressed around them, but could have no power over them. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. Many had been bound. Again, finishing the Reformation, finishing strong. Some wives by their husbands and some children by their parents. The honors who had been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold upon it. All fear of their relatives was gone, and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. It was dearer and more precious than life. I asked what had made this great change. An angel answered, It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. My beloved, as we start to wind down, I want to appeal to us. Yes, this movement started in a blaze of glory with men and women who were excited to do the work that this began. And again, as I said, this excitement did not mean that they were immune from suffering because, yes, they knew the times to which they lived, burning at the stake, beheadings, and all types of things were theirs. But just like Jesus, they looked from their current circumstances and they looked down to our time and they saw the culmination of the work and what it would mean towards the coming of the Lord. And they counted not their lives there 
unto them. In his summation, in his devotion on Monday, and as he was talking in our devotion that day, Brother Alvin said that, as I said myself, this coming year, this coming year, may very well be it, beloved. When we talk about great changes soon to take place, and the final movements being rapid ones, as we have eyes to see, I have no doubt that those of us, as Elder said on Sabbath evening, we may not be following up what's happening with Israel, but on a whole, we have eyes to see, you know, what's really happening in our world, and we can know that we are about to see in that eastern sky that small black cloud. But before then, we're going to go through stuff. But beloved, stay strong. Stay the course. Finish what God has given us to finish. It's not over yet. As I posted this past Sunday on the WhatsApp in our podcast, when your work day is over, those of you who work in a traditional job, you know, you say you work from nine to five. At five o'clock, you know, you have to clock out your work day's done. Your employer has no more hold over you. That's your time then. It's done. It's a time of rejoicing for many. They go to parties or bars or wherever. The work week, the work day's done. Songwriter says, oh, there'll be joy when the work is done. Joy when the work is gathered home. But until then, my beloved, until then, we still have some work to do. We still have our part to play in finishing the Reformation. And I trust and I pray that all within the sound of my voice will allow themselves to be refreshed by the presence of the Lord. Dust yourself off from the can you remember the word I want to use? It's let's the touching, yes, you know, the tiredness, the, the the feeling of slumber. Shake it off and move forward, because beloved, we have a glorious, glorious work to accomplish in the finishing of the gospel. And our captain, he is going to continually be with us, and as long as we continue to surrender to the promise, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. We think Brother Avin mentioned that again the other day, if not before. The harder the battle, the sweeter the victory. Oh, there'll be joy when the work is done. It's not over yet, but it'll be soon and very soon. I trust and pray, brethren, that even, even in despite of all that we're going through, we shall finish strong. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, O oh Lord God, weak and enfeebled, and constantly in need of reproof. This little company that's here assembled and our brothers and sisters around the world, Lord God, we know that this is the only institution upon which you place your supreme regard. But, oh Lord God, can we say that of ourselves? Can we say, oh Lord God, that we price you more than anything? That the darkness that's surrounding this world because we know that the times are getting to where Elder talked about Sabbath evening that the Spirit of God is withdrawing and evil, evil is taking course. Lord, oh we, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, oh Lord God, may we continue to do so. Heavenly Father, I pray that despite the challenges that we face, the overwhelming odds that are stacked against us, because apparently, apparently on the outside, on the surface, superficially, we don't have the faith of Abraham. We don't have the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Samson, the meekness of Moses. We don't have Job's tenacity. We don't even have Ruth's loyalty, apparently. But we are told that you see something in us that we cannot see. And it is not, you do not, you do not waste your time with worthless gems. But that which you're working with today, O oh Lord God, that which you're putting in your furnace and you're allowing to go through the fires of affliction, as we saw in Hosea. That which you're binding us up, Lord God, to live in your sight, Lord God, for all that you're doing for all of us, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you. And we just ask you, oh God, to help us to continue to fix our eyes steady upon Jesus Christ, our captain, and to go forward. Lord, I want to thank you for each and every one of us tonight who were in Bible class, I trust and pray that even if it was just one small thing, that it be our takeaway, that it will be our takeaway, and that we'll hold on to it and move forward with it. Thank you for the opportunity to sit in the seat on this evening and to share 
what you've placed upon my heart with my brethren, I ask you, dear Lord God, that we will indeed be the generation that puts a stamp and a seal and deliver this Reformation work, oh Lord God. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you so much for what you have allowed us to experience on tonight and indeed so far in our Christian experience. Father God, as we have continued, Lord, early on in this final year of this midnight watch, Lord, help us, help us, Lord God, to say that this is it and we are done and to have your work accomplished in us. Lord, wherever we are weak, Lord, and whatever areas find ourselves in weakness, make us strong. If we find ourselves proud, humble us, O oh Lord God. Keep our minds and our hearts in tune and not seeking the things of this world. And Father, when the cares of this life crop up, help us to remember your word, to seek you first, your kingdom, your righteousness, and knowing, O oh Lord God, that you will not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for helping us to keep our eyes fixed on you, O oh God, and to remember that the standard of truth is a person our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and with Christ, O oh God, at the head of the work. And as we follow, we know that we will follow on to victory. As we get ready to depart from this forum, Lord Jesus, please, please, I pray you to, Lord, be with us, grant us a good night's rest, Lord, and if it be your will that we arise in the morning, I pray for those of us, those early risers, Lord God, that we find ourselves in a position at our morning devotional sessions, I pray, and that you will see fit, O oh Lord God, to carry us through the rest of the way. Bless your words to our hearts continually, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Mm -hmm.